So today, the first Web EV talk for 2021, and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Suzanne Gabrielson. Suzanne has worked to understand immune effects of extracellular vesicles since the 1999, and she was the first to describe the presence of exosomes in branchiolar lavage fluid and in breast milk. She has revealed a role of EVs in lung diseases such as asthma and sarcoidosis, where they may contribute to inflammation. Her studies in animal models have given insights into how EV-based therapies should be designed to work as an immunotherapeutic treatment for cancer. So today, she's going to give us a lecture on immunologic aspect of dendritic cell-derived EVs for cancer therapy. Please welcome, Susan. Thank you very much, Carolina. The screenshot, um, Carolina. Oh yeah, do that again. So um, thank you, Carolina and Jan, for inviting me to give a talk here. Um, it will be very nice to share some of our old data, but also some quite new data. Uh, so I will try to share my screen. We just tried before this seminar and it, sometimes the uh, quality went a bit bad. So we'll see if it will be Jan who will share my presentation or not. Uh, and um, let's see, optimize for video. So what does it look like now? Is it a good uh, quality? Yeah, it looks okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, let's see. You will just need to shout if, if that yeah, stops. Yeah, will do. Uh, and also, uh, to me, it's okay to be interrupted while I talk. I just find that uh, stimulating. So uh, rather interrupt me if you have questions directly than save them all for last if that's okay with you but you can also uh, uh, take questions later if you want. is getting um, bad again the resolution shall we share with Jan Jan what do you think yeah try next slide see what it looks like no we'll we'll I'll do mine well I'll stop work. stop share Suzanne I'll share okay So you will hear a lot uh, of me saying next, next. slide. <laughs> next. Yeah, hold on for a second. So I will talk about different immunologic aspects of these DC-derived EVs for cancer therapy. Uh, Looks okay, good. You can edit out next slide, it says. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. Um, so we have some fundings and consulting, etc. cetera. Uh, so first of all, I would just like to mention that I will be talking about extracellular vesicles and uh, as you probably all know, uh, there are different kinds of vesicles and uh, we have mainly been working with the small EVs, which I tend to call exosomes. But of course, these exosomes are the ones that are derived from the endosomal compartment. And what we have done in these studies is mainly ultracentrifugation. So we cannot be sure that we only have exosomes or we know that we don't only have exosomes, but we, they are enriched for exosomes. And that's why I still call them exosomes for simplicity. Uh, we have done some studies on microvesicles as well. And we do see that they are not as efficient in these systems to load antigen. Next slide, please. So, and also, as this audience probably know, is that uh, these uh, exosomes can contain 
a lot of different cargo. They have uh, nucleic acids, lipids and proteins. And the proteins are both inside and on the surface. And the surface ones are of course more important when it comes to binding to recipient cells. Next slide, please. So we have in our group, we've been working as Carolina said for a long time with exosomes or different EVs. And we have worked with bronchoalveolar lavage fluid. We have some studies in asthma and uh, sarcoidosis. Um, but then we also do some studies in breast milk. Uh, and then uh, we found leukotriene forming enzymes in exosomes. But now I will talk about uh, the dendritic cell derived exosomes for cancer therapy that we do in mouse models. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the, in the lung, we have looked, as I said, in asthma and sarcoidosis, and there our understanding is that the exosomes in the lung, we believe that they can move out from the lungs and circulate in the body. And if you have an inflammation in the lung, these exosomes would also be able to induce inflammation in other parts of the body. Uh, so this is something that we are also pursuing. But today I will talk about the DC exosomes for therapy. Next slide. So when it comes to cancer, um, we see it as the, we have the good guys and the bad guys. And the good guys are uh, the exosomes from immune cells that stimulate the immune response. But then we have the bad guys from the cancer cells, but also from immune cells that the cancer cells modify. So these uh, bad guys, they can actually inhibit the immune response. So instead of uh, the normal uh, induction of uh, a strong immune response against the cancer, uh, these exosomes will turn this immune response off and thereby uh, the cancer cells can grow. Next slide, please. So, and we can continue to uh, we have some animation and one more, please. So if you compare dendritic cells, no, that was too much. <laughs> Previous slide, yeah. Uh, so here we have dendritic cell EVs and cancer cell derived EVs, and they are different when you look at both the content, of course, with microRNAs, uh, et cetera, but also on the surface. So the while the DC-derived ones have co-stimulatory molecules, the cancer cell-derived ones have um, co-inhibitory molecules, but they also have PDL1, which can turn T cells off. Next slide, please. So when it comes to cancer exosomes, they can inhibit immune responses in several ways. So that will be immune suppression, but they also uh, do a lot of other things to potentiate the tumor growth, and that is to prepare the pre-metastatic niche. They will use epithelial tumor synchymal transition and also angiogenesis, which is important for uh, to get enough nutrients for the cancer cells to grow. Next slide, please. Uh, but then on the other hand, the dendritic cell derived EVs, they can modulate the immune system in different ways. They, there is immune activation, but there are also reports on that they can also be immune inhibitory. Uh, so depending on the state of the dendritic cell, they can, for example, inhibit graft rejection or T cell proliferation. But the, if they are more um, stimulated uh, to induce immune responses, also their EVs will will um, be able to inhibit immune responses or potentiate immune responses. So they carry 
MHC peptide complexes, they can activate T cells and they can transfer antigens to other antigen presenting cells. Next slide, please. Uh, so when it comes to cancer treatment and exosomes, there are different possibilities. Um, so to the left, uh, you see that we could try to block secretion of tumor-derived EVs. So that is one possible way to um, target exosomes. But we could also use uh, exosomes to delivery of specific therapeutics. And that could be, of course, chemotherapy that can be um, given within the exosomes and then targeted to the tumor cells, but also microRNAs that will uh, modify the, the tumor. But uh, on the right, you see that you could also uh, stimulate uh, the different immune cells of uh, of the immune response. And there you could either have uh, a general immune stimulation or a direct T cell stimulation uh, with the specific uh, tumor peptides of neoantigens. And what would probably be the best thing is to uh, stimulate both the innate and the adaptive immune response at the same time. Next slide, please. Yes, you can click uh, again. Uh, so there are several advantages of exosomes uh, compared to cell therapy, which have been tried. Um, so the exosomes are not affected by the immunosuppressive signals from the tumor in the same way. So they are more inert than the cells that you would inject. They, they can be modified, of course, when after they are injected. Uh, and they are easily stored. You can control the content better than for live cells. And then uh, the sensitive cargo is protected from enzyme degradation. So both um, RNAs and um, CPGs, et cetera, can be better protected inside the, the exosomes. And that is why, of course, it was uh, stated already in the 90s that these DC-derived exosomes could possibly be used for, for cancer therapy. Next slide. So this is uh, an old picture from these first clinical trials. So there were uh, several clinical trials already published with dendritic cell-derived exosomes. And we have tried to continue this work uh, to modify and to also to simplify this because what was the initial studies were that you took leukapheresis of the patient and you differentiate the dendritic cell into the dendritic cells. You add the tumor antigens and then uh, you let the cells grow and produce exosomes and then you harvest them and give them back to the patient. And these studies were uh, shown they showed safety, which was really good, of course, but not so much um, immune responses. So that is why we have continued to work to trying to optimize these immune responses and try to understand what is needed and what is not needed. Next slide, please. So here, uh, this is the uh, representation of a dendritic cell and how they are taking up external antigens. So of course, when the cancer cell presents antigen directly, they will um, express the neoantigens on the MHC class one on the surface. But you can also load these neoantigens or uh, cancer specific antigens onto the antigen presenting cells. And this is what is shown here, that you load the antigen, the uh, whole proteins are then degraded into small peptides in the endosomal compartment, and then 
these peptides are loaded onto MHC molecules. And then you can get um, antigens both on MHC class one and two. And that will not only be expressed on the surface of the cell, but also on the surface of the exosomes. Uh, and this is the idea how to load these uh, cancer new antigens onto the exosomes. Next slide, please. Yes, and to do this, we have different uh, model systems, but we have mainly used the model of over expressing uh, B16 melanoma. So when we look at uh, OVA, that is ovalbumin, which is a model antigen. So then we want to see what kind of uh, immune cells are activated. So we load the exosomes with OVA and then we either wait for, for example, seven days and then have different readouts like Elispot, where we see interferon gamma producing T cells. We do fax analysis flow cytometry where we can uh, stain multiple uh, cells and see if they are activated. And we also do ELISA to see antibody responses. And in the melanoma model, we can inject the exosomes as therapeutic um, treatments. And then we look at tumor growth, infiltrating T cells in the tumor and look in the spleen whether cells have been activated or not. Next slide, please. So what we did uh, several years ago was to compare uh, different loading techniques of exosomes. So this is quite basic and there are a lot of people now trying to, um, to work to load uh, exosomes in different new ways. Um, but this is quite uh, illustrative, I think, still of what is needed for an immune response. So what we did was to either do direct loading, where we took the exosomes that were already produced, and then we lowered the pH so that the peptide in the MHC group was eluted. And then we could, by adding in extra uh, ova, that was when we increase the pH again, these um, uh, OVA peptides were uh, loaded onto the exosome. So these we call peptide exosomes. But then we also did the indirect loading, which is more natural, where we put the whole ovalbumin onto the cells and the cells take them up and process and present the antigen and also produce exosomes with antigens on them. And these we call OVA exosomes. Next slide, please. So what we saw here was that uh, it was quite opposite effects in vitro and in vivo. So in vitro, we saw that this, this uh, peptide loaded ones that we did uh, with the acid dilution were much more potent compared to the OVA exosomes, but it was the complete opposite in in vivo. So we were wondering about this uh, strange difference. And uh, we, to make a long story short, we can say that we actually found that it was on the OVA exosomes, the naturally loaded ones, we did not only have the OVA peptide, but we also have uh, the whole antigen. And we can detect it both inside and on the surface of exosomes. So actually, if we load enough protein, that will end up uh, in the exosomes. Next slide, please. And that means actually that um, you will have larger pieces and not only the T cell epitopes of these antigens on the surface. And that means that also B cells can be activated. And as you see here, this is a germinal center in the spleen. So you can actually get antibody responses to these exosomes. And we could show that if we, if we had uh, B cell knockouts uh, mice, we could not get the T cell response. 
So it means that the B cells are needed for this response. So that is uh, why we concluded that the uh, clinical trials where if you only put T cell epitopes, you will not have as good immune response as if you can also have B cell epitopes or possibly B cell targeting. That is what we are trying now. Next slide, please. So what could be going on uh, when it comes to why are the B cells important? It could be that the marginal zone B cells in the spleen, uh, they are the cells that are shuttling antigen into uh, the follicles of the spleen and uh, that could increase the contact between the exosomes and the T cells. So in vitro, you would have you would just mix the cells, of course. So then you will have both the uh, uh, exosomes and the T cells next to each other, and they can also bind other cells. So then they, the T cells are easily stimulated. But in vivo, they will not reach each other as easily. So that is why you need the B cells to help with this. Next slide, please. So then we moved on to try to further potentiate immune response. And we looked to the natural killer T cells, the NKT cells, because we knew that uh, the exosomes from dendritic cells had CD1D on the surface. And CD1D um, is uh, a receptor that can bind different uh, peptide uh, antigens like alpha-galactosyl ceramide. So we put alpha-galactosyl ceramide, which we know stimulate NKT cells. Next slide, please. Uh, so we just added one extra step in this process where we also loaded the exosomes with alpha-galser. Next slide. Uh, so what we saw was that this alpha galser not only stimulated NKT cells, but they also potentiated the OVA-specific T cell response. So we had a higher proliferation and much more interferon gamma production, which was OVA-specific. So of course the NKT cells produced uh, interferon gamma, but they that also boosted the specific immune response. So we think that this would be a good way to amplify the cancer-specific immune response. Uh, and we could also show uh, that these, uh, uh, the exosomes uh, were much more efficient than the uh, soluble form of alpha galser because alpha galser had been tried as an adjuvant in cancer therapy. Uh, so, when it comes to NKT cells, here you see that the soluble alpha galser is more potent to stimulate NKT cells than the exosomes. But in the next graph, uh, the OVA specific T cells, they are uh, more activated if the exosomes contain alpha galser and OVA compared to the free uh, antigens. So it's a way, I mean, the exosomes induce less um, uh, regular or uh, general immune stimulation, but they induce more specific immune stimulation. Next slide, please. Uh, and one thing why the alpha galser was abandoned as a, as a cancer treatment was that if you inject uh, alpha galser more than once, the NKT cells became an anergic, so they lost their potency. So that is why you couldn't uh, give, the, give it more than once. But here we could show that if we injected the alpha galser on the exosomes, 
you kept the act activity much better than if you only gave soluble ones. So for the NK T cells, you see that after the second injection, this is ex vivo stimulation. The interferon gamma could still be produced by these NK T cells. And also, if you re stimulated uh, T cells, they could still be activated. And they these um, mice then had memory T cells, which were specific for O1. Next slide, please. Uh, so we also tested this in the tumor model where we saw that these were more efficient compared to um, the free-soluble free form. Sorry. <coughs> <clears throat> next slide, please. So then our next question was, uh, since we then saw that we had the whole ova on the surface of the exosomes, we asked, can we actually, do we actually need the, the MHC complex on the exosomes and do we need the um, T cell epitopes. So what we decided to compare was uh, the different uh, ways of the, how could exosomes uh, present antigen to T cells. So in the, in the bottom here, you see that one way of how exosomes could stimulate T cells would be that the exosomes bind directly to the T cell. Uh, you can press a button yarn so we see uh, so here the exosomal MHC is needed because then it's a direct binding and then in above that in the next scenario then you would have uh, that the exosomes are taken up by the dendritic cells and then the MHC is transferred with the peptide out to the surface of the DC and then the exosomal MHC would be needed too. And in the third scenario, the uh, exosomes will be taken up by the APC and then just uh, the antigens will be degraded and then presented on the host MHC. And there the exosomal MHC would not be needed. So we tried this, next slide please. Uh, we tried this in the uh, in the MHC knockout uh, mice. So we produced uh, dendritic cells from mouse which lack MHC class one. And then we gave these exosomes and they still carried ovalbumin, the whole protein. As, and as you can see, you get the similar immune responses, both for NKT cells, for CD4 and CD8 uh, responses. So. Uh, these work in a similar way as uh, exosomes with MHC on the surface. Next slide, please. And here you see that these exosomes were really potent in inducing antibody responses uh, in the top and in the bottom, they could also uh, delay cancer progression. So they were equally good as compared to uh, the wild type exosomes. Next slide, please. Uh, and then as an immunologist, uh, you might ask if you, because we all both did MSC knockouts and allogenic exosomes, and the allogenic exosomes could possibly induce uh, allo reactivity. So we asked whether it what would happen if we inject these exosomes several times. So this is two time injections of allogeneic exosomes. Next slide, please. Uh, so here you see that uh, these uh, allo react allo exosomes they actually enhance the antigen specific immune activation as well. So you have a slight 
um, increased uh, general immune activation, which will actually work as an adjuvant to give a slightly higher uh, OVA specific uh, immune response, both when it comes to pentamer positive cells and interferon gamma in response to, uh, to OVA in Ellis spot. Next slide, please. And when we did this long term four month um, uh, experiments where we first uh, gave exosomes and then boosted after four months with uh, soluble OVA, we saw a strong immune response to these exosomes and it was quite similar and slightly higher if you had uh, allogenic exosomes actually. And uh, in the tumor model we saw uh, strong immune responses and can press another uh, slide. Yeah, we, because we also saw that the antibodies have a much higher avidity. So they are much better at neutralizing the, the antigen. Next slide, please. Uh, so then we also performed the tumor model in this system and we saw that the allogenic exosomes were as good as uh, the syngeneic uh, exosomes. So uh, next slide, please. And uh, again, these um, uh, exosomes gave a really potent uh, antigen or um, antibody immune response. Next slide. So we tried to draw this uh, uh, as um, abstract to the to these um, publications, uh, saying that it is it would be possible to have off the shelf exosomes in a, in another way than was previously thought. So uh, even for specific cancer antigens, you would need to know the mio antigens of the patient, and that is actually done now. Um, in many hospitals, the whole tumors are, are sequenced. So we know what the neoantigens are present in each tumor. And then you could load uh, cells which do not have to be the patient's own cells, but you could use uh, a cell line or some or a donor cell to produce these exosomes. Next slide, please. So a recent publication that we just uh, got published, um, we stepped back and asked what are what kind of NK cells are actually stimulated in this treatment. So as I said, we had alpha gelser which stimulate NKT cells, but these NKT cells they in turn stimulated natural killer cells, NK cells. And as most people working with cancer, they say it's very hard to treat a solid tumor because you will have a disparity within the tumor. You have some cells that express MHC and of course those, if they present the antigen, uh, cytotoxic T cells can kill these cells. But in other parts of the tumor, the cells downregulate the MHC to avoid the immune uh, system. And these cells without MHC class one, they can be killed by natural killer cells, NK cells. Uh, and we saw that we had an activation of these NK cells as well. So uh, we contacted Klaus Scherre, who is, uh, was the discoverer of NK cells at the Karolinska Hospital. Uh, so they helped us to analyze what kind of natural killer cells were activated. Next slide, please. Uh, so first of all, we just uh, uh, determined that 
the alpha gals are induced NK cell activation. And we saw that this was not due to a direct effect on the NK cells, but if we did it in, uh, in NK T cell knockout mice, we did not see this uh, activation. So that means that it, this NK cell activation is dependent on NK T cells. Next slide, please. Uh, and these NK cells, uh, it's very complicated. So I will just try to simplify to cell to say that there are uh, NK cells can, in the presence of MHC class one, they will be self licensed. So they will be, uh, um, they will be uh, taught by the own cells that uh, they should uh, be not reacting when the self MHC is present, but if the MHC disappears, then they should be activated because then it's something wrong. And the, uh, the MHC can be downregulated either by uh, viruses or by uh, a tumor uh, change of the cells. I have a question here. How do you load alpha galser to the exosomes? So what we do there is we actually, um, we just give the alpha galser to the cells that produce the exosomes. But um, actually, uh, alpha galser binds directly to CD1D on the surface. So you shouldn't really need to use um, that, they, that they are processed. They can also bind directly, uh, which is different from the MHC complex. Uh, so these um, educated cells, um, they are actually more potent when it comes to tumor killing. So we were interested to see whether there is an imbalance in the educated over uneducated cells when we do this treatment. Uh, these uh, educated cells also have a lower threshold for activation. Next slide, please. And we used uh, to the far right down here, you see that the more uh, mature the NK cells are, the more KLRG1 they express. So we looked at this uh, marker uh, on the NK cells. Next slide, please. Uh, this uh, paper just came out in cancer, so you can have a look at it. Uh, but what we did was to first see what cells are expanding in uh, response to alpha galser to where it says F here. So we have circled those areas in red. Uh, and then when we compare with the KLRG1, you see you have an almost complete overlap, the green areas within the red areas in H. So uh, it, those cells that really expand more are the uh, self-educated uh, NK cells. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we conclude from this study is that alpha gals are loaded. Uh, so both the alpha gals are, which is soluble and the alpha gals are loaded exosomes induce self-educated NK cells. And they can actually also induce uh, tumor killing to a higher extent. Uh, but they do actually uh, stimulate both uh, educated and non-educated -educ NK cells, but even more when it comes to educated ones. Next slide, please. Uh, so this, uh, here you see the tumor cell killing, which is uh, increased uh, when you have exosomes. And so relative survival means that the lower bar, the more efficient they are. So the uh, soluble one is even higher, but here we actually had the higher dose. So uh, 
also the exosomes are potent in killing the tumor. Next slide, please. And these are the kinetics where we see even it's very high after 14 days of uh, this missing self response is really strong after 14 days. So just to summarize, uh, this is an old slide, but still quite valid that uh, exosomes are uh, really potent inducers of immune responses. And there are still several options where we could, how we could use them and to further harness them to, to make them even more potent for immune stimulation. For example, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have leukotriene forming enzymes and they are very potent in inducing inflammation. So maybe we could also alter these enzymes to have it more immune stimulating exosomes. And I think um, this uh, talk has been on cancer therapy, but I think it's very promising also for uh, for prophylactic vaccines for viral infections, since we see such strong antibody responses as well to these exosomes. Next slide, please. And by that, I would like to thank especially the group and former members of the group, and then all our collaborators and research report. And thank you again for inviting me and I will take more questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. So where I get a strong echo somewhere. Is that with you, Susan? I think so. When people ask you should probably mute your microphone in a second. Um, yeah. so please please put your questions in the <clears throat> in the uh, chat box as usual, and uh, we start there. So who's number one here? Min, Min Lee. If you unmute yourself and ask your question, please. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's, thank you for the great talk. I'm really glad to attend the Web BB again for the first time of the year. So happy new year. Um, my question, I have several questions and Susan has already answered the first one. Um, the second question is uh, the, about biodistribution. I wonder if, if you have labeled the, the exosomes and you see where do they go with different organs. Um, I, I guess they have to go to the lymph node uh, in order to activate uh, the T cells and um, to activate dendritic cells, uh, but I wonder whether if they go to the, they, they, they also go to other cell type dimensions, uh, NK cells, um, but is, is, the, is that the main cell type that take up the EVs or they also, they are also taken up by macrophage because that uh, the cells that normally take up uh, exosome of uh, other type, a, a, macrophage in um, different tissues, especially in the liver. So how, how much clearer are there? Um, also what type uh, of- Yeah, I can, uh, I can reply that we haven't done very much on that actually. Uh, we, we tried uh, several years ago, but uh, then we couldn't, I mean, the only dyes that were good enough then, because we didn't want, only want to see what organ, we, we know that they go to both spleen and lung and liver, et cetera. Others have shown that, but we wanted to see exactly what cells they go to. And we didn't want to use this PKH dye since that as soon as you inject them, they, that can be transferred from the exosomes to other cells. So, um, so it's hard to know, you're, you're tracing the, the dye, but maybe not the exosomes. So that is why we didn't pursue that at that time. But now there are better dyes, of course, and we will try again to look, because uh, I can recommend, for example, Samira Landalusi's papers where they have done a lot of biodistribution studies, but 
that is for other kinds of exosomes. So we would like to see, of course, where our, our exosomes go, but we haven't done that much of that yet. And do you see the effect in the limb not only or on, also the spleen? If you look at activation of the nidic cell and gay cells, where are they? Yes, we see a very strong activation in the spleen. Spleen, okay. Thank you. Have you considered uh, using tumor derived exosomes as uh, carriers of new antigens? Uh, yes, we have considered it. I think it can be a good idea. Um, you, do you mean to, I mean, what you could either do is to, to take the tumor derived ones and then harness them with activating agents and give them directly like Margot Söller have done. Uh, but then you could also just add these tumor exosomes to, to the dendritic cells and let them process and then harvest the exosomes from those. So that is a possibility, but I think now we, we will, as I mentioned, soon be able to to get new antigens from uh, that are uh, produced directly for each patient. So then you don't need to to take the the exosomes, but you can just load uh, the peptides directly uh, if you do the uh, sequencing of each uh, tumor. So <laughs> yeah, there are a number of companies that are developing these peptides uh, as a library and then you choose a certain mm. um, yeah. number of them. <clears throat> That's certainly a possibility, uh, of course. Any other uh, question? Uh, Esther, please. Yeah, thanks, uh, Suzanne, for this very nice overview. Um, I was actually wondering, until now, have you only tried uh, IV administration of uh, the exosomes or did you, for example, also try uh, intradermal because, well, the type of dendritic cells that then uh, take up the uh, exosomes will also be different and it may or may not work uh, better? No, that is, it's been for a long time on our to-do list. I think uh, it would be very interesting. We tried IP a few times, but that didn't work uh, as well at that time. Uh, so then we decided to stick to the IV. But I think intradermal, as you say, that could be very interesting as well. Definitely. Yeah, that's worth uh, trying, I think. And I had yeah, another yeah. question. Um, the, the, the whole repertoire of NK cells is, of course, very diverse, and uh, there's all kind of subpopulations that, that differ in their immune, in, immune inhibitory and activating receptors. So do you have any idea whether the uh, exosomes target a specific subsets of NKs? Uh, so when you say target, you mean binding yeah directly yeah, yeah. Uh, no that we don't know i mean the effects that we saw here were mainly most of them were uh, actually both depending on nkt cells but also on dendritic cells so we have the feeling that most of this is uh, the NK cell activation is not a direct effect of the binding of exosomes to NK cells, but more that they stimulate dendritic cells and NKT cells, and then they in turn activate the NK cell. Right, and, and I can't remember very well, but uh, um, do you think this somehow relates to uh, the older um, clinical trial data where also the injection of dendritic cell uh, vesicles uh, in uh, tumor patients were activating NK cell uh, responses or were those NKT cells? I thought they were NK cells, no? They, they were NK cells, yes. 
And I'm not sure they looked at NK T cells at that time. Um, so what I saw there might also have been a secondary effect, you think? Yeah, it could be, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can, you can. Hi, Susanna. Yeah, thank you for your nice talk. <laughs> Good to see you again. So I was wondering during your talk, um, you need an active immune system, right? If you treat uh, the patients. Um, did you, do you know whether uh, age would have a role if you treat age, uh, older patients, um, uh, whether that would work at the same as when you would have it in younger um, patients? Because I think the mice that you used were not really old. No, um, that's true. So could it have a role? And maybe you could test it in your um, animal model? Because these animals would get tumors themselves as well, right? When they get uh, older. Not very much. Uh, you would, uh, I mean, uh, mice are not, uh, don't get so much cancer as compared to, oh, to so. humans, actually. So it might not be ideal to look at aging mice, but I think it, um, it's a very good point and you would probably need to e even have a better immune activation to kickstart an old immune response, an old yeah. immune system, definitely. Well, to test the, the, the degree of activity of the immune system, you could full body irradiate the mice or something like that to a different degree, perhaps to reduce the, the function of the immune system. I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe. So it's the same. <laughs> as mm. oh. Yeah, it yeah could be. mimic yeah. aging. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? That's a good point. Thanks. Uh, otherwise, I uh, say thank you very much to Susanna. Thank you very much for, uh, for attending and asking questions. And I give the word back to Carolina. And I want to thank you, John, for uh, helping me switching the slides. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much both. Uh